Tonight, we'll be introducing you to three of the best of the best, women in science and engineering who are at the top of their game. And we'll be conducting a interactive discussion with them and with you as an audience about the roles and the potential of women in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. First, let me introduce our three panelists. Professor, uh, Baroness Professor Susan Green Greenfield, CBE, is a neurologist at the University of Oxford with 30 honorary degrees from British and foreign universities. She is recognised internationally for both her scientific research, but also her advocacy for science education and the roles of women in science. She also informs me she is an honorary Australian. Officially. <laughs> Officially. Yeah. Marita Chang is uh, still a university student here in Melbourne at the University of Melbourne, where she's studying for a Bachelor of Engineering and a Bachelor of Computer Science. In 2008, she founded RoboGals Global, a program of fun and educational activities to teach schoolgirls about engineering, and in 2012, she was named Young Australian of the Year. And Professor Fiona Stanley, AC, has spent much of her career researching the causes of major childhood illness, such as birth defects and the epidemiology surrounding children's health. She is the founding director and patron of the Telethon Institute uh, for Child Health Research, as well as a distinguished research professor at the University of Western Australia and the Vice Chancellor's Fellow and Director of the, Universe, uh, of the Festival of Ideas 2013 at the University of Melbourne. She's also voted Australian of the Year for 2003. Would you please make my guests feel very welcome? we'll move on to the, the beginning of our discussion, which actually relies on another slide here. But um, it, essentially, it's a slide from a report that you did, Susan, 10 years ago or so in England, uh, showing the, the difference between uptake of a career in science mm -hmm. for men and women. Mm -hmm. Can you describe that chart for us? What did you find? Well, it's, it's, it's not here. It's not here. But the, uh, the findings of that okay, report. Well, okay, so the report was called Set Fair. Set, of course, is science, engineering, and technology. And it was commissioned by the British government in 2002 to um, enhance the retention and recruitment of women in science. I'm not sure of the many charts there are in that report, and it is available, I think, still on the, on the web. Um, there's one in particular that really got me. Oh, here we go. Here we go. So, um, well, okay, so you can see the, the slightly old dates there. Um, but clearly the biosciences, it's more of a, of a level playing field than for the physical sciences and certainly for engineering. Um, this actually um, is something we saw uh, sadly reversed in later years, and we may come on to that. That is to say, after people had done their PhD um, in biomedical sciences, things scissored out to be the same lamentable ratio that you see for chemistry and engineering and technology. Um, What's made me sad about this report, the British government commissioned the great amount of money of about a million pounds only, which um, would have paid for two or three small fellowships. And Sheffield Hallam University in the UK tried to pick up some of the recommendations, but inevitably, because it was resource starved, um, many of the recommendations stayed just that. And uh, the situation is pretty much the same. And much of what I'll talk about um, this afternoon probably is still based on the findings we had there, because I don't think things have changed that much. If we go on to these results, this is from more recent data from Australia, and this is looking at places in engineering, 2009-2010. Uh, um, Marita, you are, in fact, an engineering student at the moment. Does that hold true for you? How many, how many uh, females are there in your class? So the statistics are that 14% um, of engineering students are female, and of the graduating class, 17% female graduate. So um, engineering is actually known for having a very high attrition rate, and uh, it's about 45%. So what they're finding is once females actually enter their degree, they don't tend to drop out, and it's, it's mostly the guys that drop out. So the main problem with women in engineering is actually getting them into the degree in the first place, which is what RoboGals tries to do. So these results don't actually hold true for you uh, at university. There are, in fact, uh, there is better gender equality in your courses. Um, 14%. 14? Yes. Oh, I thought you said 40. <laughs> I, I do apologise. In that case, that's entirely consistent and with in, that. And, and in my classes, um, 
in my degree, mechatronics engineering, there were five girls out of 50. Um, and I, I've been to a lot of tutorials where I'm the only girl out of 20, or lectures where there's three girls out of 60. So it, it's still that, that for me. That must be a very intimidating environment to work in. Oh, you get used to it. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, all those engineers, yeah. uh, that would be intimidating for anyone. So uh, is, the, is the dropout higher for women? Oh, no, it's higher for men. It's higher for men? Yeah. And uh, what about in the, the medical sciences, Fiona? Well, it's a very different picture, and it's changed dramatically over the time since I went into med medical school, um, where I was one of six out of 100 women, and now there are more women who get into medical school than men. And in the biological sciences, so the people who would feed into, if you like, to medical research and biological, biomedical research, 80% are female. Um, but as you go through the system, as you, as you like, your, your trajectory in science, then that's, I think, the debate that we still have, that um, you, you've got this wonderful group of women who are coming in and being trained, but what are the factors which are making them not achieve and not continue and to not get to positions where they get postdoctoral fellowships, where they get the grants, where they get the, the capacity to actually uh, do their work and do their research? I think that's still an issue. But it is amazing, this change. Yeah. Amazing. So the men are going into other areas which may be more lucrative, um, but they're not in the biological sciences as they used to be. They used to dominate the biological sciences. And it's interesting, I've noticed a similar thing in geology, uh, that a really? lot of geology courses really? these days, in fact, have more females than uh, males wow. in the undergraduate level. Didn't know that. But very few, few females are going on to complete a PhD or to yeah. go out and work yeah. as a geologist. Yeah. Um, well, we're getting a lot of women through PhDs. Sorry? A lot of women are going into PhDs, so it's after that where the crunch seems to come. What, what, what it, it explains this spread well, of results? I think what's really interesting, I think there's two issues here, both of which are really interesting. The first is, why should biomedical sciences be more popular with women than other sciences? And then also, what goes wrong after those first few years? And I don't know how my co-panelists feel, but my own very brief answer to both of those is I think that girls and women feel more comfortable. You're sort of indoctrinated quite early on if you're female sometimes. that You have to be a people person. You know, you have to get on with people and so on. So therefore, it's somehow more acceptable to do science that's related much more directly to people with parche fossils and so on, but, you know, um, than uh, things that have very fast or very slow uh, timescales or things that have very um, small or very large spatial scales, which therefore don't encompass your normal everyday life, but are the essence of the physical sciences. And I think it may be because girls, especially school girls, can relate to getting on with people and treating people, talking to people. That might be one reason. I'd be interested yeah. what my I, colleagues yes, say. I mean, throughout yeah. this year when I've been giving all my speeches, I showed slides of all the different types of engineering and I'd get up to biomedical engineering and show, and show all these, you know, show the cochlear implant and the bionic ear and the bionic eye. And afterwards, all these girls would come up to, to me and say, I, I'm really interested in being a biomedical engineer. Mm. And they wouldn't say anything about the civil engineering or the mechanical engineering. And so what I did was I changed all my slides around and I got rid of biomedical engineering and put all those <laughs> pictures into electrical engineering, mechanical engineering, civil engineering. So all the <laughs> different types of engineering had an element of helping people and improving yeah. quality of life. So what, what do the panel think? Does, does it really matter that, that we have gender equality, that if the science gets done, that it doesn't matter whether it's a, a, a man or a woman, surely? Do I go first? Oh, I am being devil's advocate oh, here, yes, by the I way. Think, but that's OK. Yeah. Um, I, I think it matters hugely. Um, and that just in my sort of observation and in my research career, uh, men and women do have different approaches to science, and they do science in different ways. And both of them are hugely valuable and very important. And, I mean, Elizabeth um, Blackburn's a very good example. I mean, she's looked at telomere and uh, telomere length, but she's looked at it in relation to stress in pregnancy. And I think that's a really important thing. It might be the way that, in fact, her basic science gets translated into a very important aspect of pregnancy and outcomes for babies. That's just one example. Look at the difference between some of the male dominated questions and, and the female ones. I'm thinking, again, of uh, these are examples from my area, um, the kinds of research that obstetricians do compared with the kind of research that midwives do. Now, they're obviously very different groups of people, but it's really been important to have both of those perspectives. Otherwise, you'd get 
all of the research about how women feel about themselves and their pregnancies and how they relate to their children might not be covered. And that's incredibly important. So I think there's a really wonderful, rich tapestry of having both genders fully represented in science. That I've given medical examples, and they may think that's sort of touchy-feely, but I'm sure that you could give the same kind of examples when you get into the more basic physical and chemical sciences. Because it has because been... Because we do think differently, and I well, think it's well, great that we do. But it's also been said that uh, women will set a lab up differently, uh, <laughs> in, in that uh, they will tend to have a more inclusive, more um, uh, communicative yeah. group and team yeah. rather than put people on specific problems and get them to work in isolation. Yeah. Is, is, is that a stereotype? Is that true? Sorry? Do you want to ask that question? Um, well, That's just the question. Uh, yeah. uh, well, I was just going to say that I think the lack of women in higher positions and in leadership roles in, in engineering and science uh, is actually a sad reflection on society not utilising half the population. I mean, we have all these brilliant young women that are going through their uh, degrees and getting the, their PhDs and getting their training, um, but then dropping out, and I think... That is a, a huge problem. Oh, that we true, true, but what is it that women are bringing to science oh. that men aren't? Sure. I, think, I think the first question, before we get on to that, is what, uh, what prompts the question, what if there are more men than women in science? Why would that be the case? Yeah? Now, if it's the case that women are bad at science, then it's not a problem, because what we want is the best science done. And does anyone remember this guy, Larry Summers? Yes. Oh, yes. Yeah, a hiss, you know, sort of <laughs> pantomime hiss. About five years ago, um, he's an economist in the States, but he nonetheless thought he was an expert on gender differences and said that women weren't good at science because at maths. they it were was particularly maths, I think it was. Do you remember yeah. that? Yeah. Because yeah. they have a smaller brain. Yeah, yeah, because we weren't so good. Now, <laughs> now if, if Larry Summers was correct, you know, and that women aren't so good, then fine, it's not a problem. There's more men doing science. But I bet... If you did your clicker thing, how many people believe that? There'd be zero. Well, if it worked, it'd be zero people doing that. <laughs> so, so, therefore, so therefore, we have to think, what is the issue? And I think it's not so much for so long as the science gets done, because that's assuming it's a bit like um, taking out an appendix. Sorry to anyone that takes out appendices a living. It's not that. As Fiona said, science is not about just everyone doing the same thing, and it doesn't matter who does it. It's about bringing your individual... Yep. Take it's like writing a novel, much more than taking out appendix. It's actually no one does science like you do, whether you're a man or a woman. And my own view is it's not so much whether you're male or female, it's that you're you. And you ask the questions you ask, just like you wouldn't say a male novelist and a female novelist. You're just you. You do your science and you write your novel like no one else does. And if you're prevented from doing that for some reason, then the world is the poorer. Let, let, let's start out with the, the tool of positive discrimination, the idea of um, providing... Uh, opportunities to ensure that more women are, have uh, the option of taking up a job or taking up uh, career opportunities once they've got the job. Um, is it a good idea, do you think, Fiona? Well, there's been an incredible success story, which I'd like to mention, which certainly the University of Melbourne and all the universities have uh, partaken in, and we now have closed the gap for Aboriginal students coming into Australian universities in medicine. There is no gap. So 3% of the intake now in medical school is Aboriginal. And that's been active, positive discrimination to recruit, to first of all, to try and encourage Aboriginal students from school to, to do subjects that will enable them to get in, and then bridging courses and all that. I mean, it's a really outstanding achievement, I think. And it's been done relatively quickly. So, of course, they've got to graduate and they've got to go on and, 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 and have all the pathways there. But I think that that kind of positive discrimination is great. Well, why is it any different to do that for another group that's not been able to get a leg in? Um, and I strongly support um, positive discrimination to boost the numbers of women in science because of the things we've been saying. How valuable it is to have women in these areas. We didn't get back to your question about women setting up labs or women running institutes, about which I am very strongly supportive, but that women do it differently. And it's a great environment when a woman's at the head. I can say this now, I've stepped down from my job. It was terrific, you know, and it was a different institute because I was at the head of it. And it was very, very enjoyable to work in that institute and everyone's fed that back to me. So people actually really enjoyed being an institute headed up by a woman. So I think there are those positive things. So I think we should positively discriminate because there are such benefits that come from that. Susan, you're not a great fan of positive discrimination. No, I'm not. And before um, 
people think you know, that I'm against this wonderful um, result that Fiona said with the indigenous peoples. Bear in mind, as an outsider, I'm aware that this is a very sensitive issue in this country, although I don't understand it fully. Um, but you're saying it's 3%. Yes, it reflects 3% yeah. of the We're population. Yeah, yeah, we see that's different from 50% of the population. If, if you say, oh, yes. um, you know, so yeah. that's within the signals, you know, when the margins of error or noise, yeah. one could admit a further 3% yeah. or so on. Yeah. That couldn't be the case with 50. So with respect, I question how validly one can extrapolate from that yeah. kind of yes. um, uh, action to extrapolating that entirely to all women. Yeah, that's, that's my first thought. Yeah, yeah I, OK, we'll, yeah. we'll keep discussing, because I yeah. think it can, it, the, the, I think there are similar issues. Sure, that way. but nonetheless, um, I, as a woman, wouldn't want to get a job if I had achieved it through positive discrimination. And it also, surely you want the best person to do the job. Now, I have this, I'm at Oxford University, and we've had a similar thing with um, people from deprived backgrounds, where we were um, absolutely lambusted by the government of a few years ago by saying that we weren't taking people from disadvantaged backgrounds. And the argument ran, we're at the end of the food chain. We can't right the wrongs of society. You know, We have to ensure the best people, in that case, got the best university places, or in this case, get the best job. You can't right the social ills by doing that. It's not fair on the individual if they're then not up to it. It's not fair on the more able person, and it's not their fault if they were born into some more privileged category. And so I'm afraid we have to think of other ways of doing this. You said also, why not hold the men back in some way? Um, well, what about if, um, if you're a different constituency of man, you're not being held back? You know, I think that once we start to bring in factors other than the ability to do the job, then we are on a rather perilous course, myself. Marita, have you encountered positive discrimination? Um, there's a lot of scholarships for women in engineering that all my River Girls friends like because they get a lot of money. Um, one of the ideas that you is had that, in your... Can I just, that's a bit different from what Susan was saying, is that you get a job because you're a woman, not because you're good. Whereas if you give a scholarship to someone to get them oh, up that's to different. par... Yeah. That's, no, that's, no, that that's, ring fence but, scholarships, ring fence fellowships, different things. That's what we're but talking about. That's but, exactly but is, what we're talking about. But isn't there an, an element of a positive discrimination if the fellowship is gender-based? Yes, but that's what we're talking about. The way to do it is to bring the women up, not to select a woman because she's a woman, not because she's good. I think there's a very important distinction to make there, and I'm really sorry okay. to interrupt, Marie, and I'll so, keep Sorry, Marie. On. Um, one of the other points that you had in your notes was that perhaps the hex fees could be free for women going into science and engineering degrees, and I think that's a great idea because I have a $40,000 hex. <laughs> 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 um, it's a good one. Probably. Yeah, it is a good one. Um, but the, the thing that I wrote down as well is that I read recently, um, I mean, there's a very famous talk given by Sheryl Sandberg, who's a CEO of Facebook, and she tells women to lean forward, to put their hand up more, to get involved in opportunities. And this report basically said, well, women are doing that. They are trying to lean forward. They are trying to put themselves out there. But where this, um, and they even negotiate for their pay, but they only negotiate for their salary if it says that their salary is negotiable. Otherwise, they're scared for it. And I actually have an example of, of this. My housemate, she's a software engineer. And she was told that there would be a pay rise after six months on the job. But she didn't ask for one then. And now it's been two years, and she still hasn't asked for one. And she's been given more and more responsibility. So I think there is still um, a stigma against women asking for a pay rise. Every time I talk to her, I say, have you got that pay rise yet? Go and get that pay rise. And, um, um, and I think maybe an ad campaign to encourage women to negotiate their salaries. Be, be more would be, assertive. Would be good. I, I think if we're Have you had about a problem this? being assertive at all, Susan? <laughs> Imagine if I was a man. <laughs> if I was a man. No, I think we ought to be very careful here because one size doesn't fit all. And either we're talking about fellowships or we're talking about places at university or we're talking about jobs at different stages where the ratios are different. Are we talking about 100 people applying for one job? Are we talking about a certain percentage getting university places? Are we talking about ring fence fellowships for certain minorities that doesn't exclude others having similar opportunities, albeit not that fellowship? All these things are very different. And I think that we can't have a broad brush, one size fits all um, standard statement. We have to think of each of those things. And for me, the guiding thing is that the most able people should be able to do and realize their potential. And if for some reason they have been disadvantaged, we should write that in society, not try and fix it at the other end. Can, can that actually come down to a decision sometime, Fiona, where you've got, you're, you're making a choice between someone who's eligible for a, a positive discrimination, in this case uh, it's a female applicant, but there is actually a, a male applicant who on paper is better. 
How would you play that? Oh, well, there's no, no decision. You have to take the best applicant. Mm. Absolutely no, no at all. But what you would do then, probably I would do, is I would talk to the woman, go through her CV and mm. mentor her so that, in fact, and, and tell her what she needed to do to get up to speed, where I might not do that for a male applicant who failed. <laughs> <laughs> That's well, discrimination. Yes, you <laughs> you realise we've got that on tape. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> Well, but, I mean, but this is this is particularly trying to get the sort of the women, yeah. the women up. But I, I mean, I, I actually do spend a lot of time mentoring men as well. So, um, but I, I do think that's the sort of you, there's no decision there. You just have to get the best person. So I'm absolutely with Susan on that one. But it's doing other things and acknowledging that women have had a harder trajectory, and it is tougher for them, particularly if they've had children to actually have the same track record. So what you'd love to do is be able to assess whether this woman is going to actually shine better than this particular man who hasn't had those barriers to his, his uh, trajectory. And I think that's a hard one. So um, what would you do to level the playing field then? What, for women? Well, first of all, mentoring. Someone wants to find a mentor or someone who believes in you more than you Can believe be in mentor. yourself. Yeah, that's just... <laughs> Can you be my mentor? For sure. Great. <laughs> I'm, I'm um, so I think that's this. the first thing. And Again, just to elaborate on that mentoring thing, because it is very important, often women will put themselves or find themselves in a situation where they don't quite know how to respond to some unpleasant man in the lab, say. So I'm not looking at you deliberately like no, that. Thank you. Um, <laughs> some unpleasant man in the lab um, who's upsetting them, because either if you start shouting back and asserting yourself back, they, you're then labelled as strident or hysterical, you know, that doesn't want to do that. Or you bottle it all up and that corrodes you and you lose sleep at night. And so quite often, and I used to be, you know, one's in a problem of feeling it's not quite right or you're unhappy about a situation. But as a woman, no one's given you the toolkit. No one's helped Maybe. you do it. And that's why I always said, find someone. It can be a woman, but it also can be a man. But if you can laugh at a situation, that's the secret. You know, so if a man is bullying you... Um, or you're upset by something, once you can laugh at it, it is contained. Remember um, Charlie Chaplin, you know, the great dictator who got everyone laughing at Hitler? You know, as soon as you can laugh at something, it can no longer have its effect on you. And also, you can laugh directly at the bully, if you like. That mm. disarms them even more. That's, mm. You know. mm. uh, but, so in that sense, that would be one way of doing it, is to get mentors. I think also um, women go in apologising for the three out of ten desiderata they don't have, whereas men go in promoting the seven out of ten things they do have. Uh, women suffer from something called the imposter syndrome, where they feel they're not good enough to apply or they'll be found out um, or someone will see through them and so on. I think all those things um, need, to be, need to be tackled. And then, of course, we need to go to the root cause, rather like disadvantage, rather like the Aboriginal issue. You have to find out what is causing the issue and start from the start to have a, a, a fairer society rather than fixing it at the end. What about uh, earlier on uh, you identified that um, the elephant in the room in a lot of cases is the idea of having a child, of going on maternity leave. Mm. How do you level the playing field there? Because um, particularly if it's on a grant-based uh, mm -hmm. environment mm -hmm. where money is short, Fiona... Well, I think when you look at the data from, you know, ARC, NHMRC here, and the, the fall-off after PhDs in both the biological sciences and the, and the medical sciences, it's quite obvious that we're not getting this one right. We're not getting it right at all in terms of enabling a really hot shot, or even a, 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 a not even a hot shot, but just a, a, a good science graduate in these areas to continue working and being a mum. So on the one hand, all the research that we're doing um, is showing you know, how important early childhood is and you have to nurture your child's brain and you have to love it and breastfeed for 12 months and all this sort of thing. At the same time, we're saying, okay, you've got to have your grants, you've got to have PhD students, you've got to have international um, invitations to speak and you have to have this number of uh, you know, awards and everything. It's just incompatible. Um, I mean, I think women are, going to f are finding it very difficult to, to have that all. And men don't find that anywhere near as much because they don't do the caring. We, all, the, all the studies have shown that women are doing not only most of the childcare, but a lot of the, the uh, domestic chores as well. So I think we have to have a real look at not just enabling, you know, having better childcare and, and, uh, and uh, re-entry fellowships and those sorts of things, but we actually have to think probably of the changing the way we assess excellence in research trajectories and taking really into account the fact that women are having this wonderful contribution to society by being a mother and that that should be taken into account in her trajectory and I think that's a really really important one but we do need to make those workplaces more flexible 
as well as assessing excellence differently. I mean, I'll just give you one example. I, I was very young when I went on an NHMRC committee, and one of the proposals I made was that we take away the age limit for training fellowships. Hardly huge. None of the men on the committee had ever thought about that. But I had a particular couple of women in mind that I knew were not going to be eligible for these training fellowships. And of course, it helped men as well who might want to have changed their trajectory and gone into a training fellowship. But they did it in a minute. They just changed it like that because somebody who understood had changed it. So those sorts of things, I think, can make a huge difference. Just uh, getting women on committees that are going to change the way science is assessed. I'll come to you in just a moment, Susan. But Marita, um, I imagine sometime in the future you'll think about having kids. How uh, uh, come uh, and this talk to me, darling? Oh. <laughs> The thing is, it was in The Age a couple of weeks ago, and it was a full-page um, article that said, what's next? Business and babies. So anyone who lives in Melbourne might have seen that. <laughs> because I, I know my boyfriend's family keep bringing it up. <laughs> but, you know, from this pers uh, perspective, uh, you, you haven't even finished your degrees, but in your, in your career path, somewhere along the line, you're going to have to confront this issue. Sure. Are you doing any planning or uh, thinking about how you're going to tackle that? Sure. Stop I mean, sniggering in the front my, row. My friends, <laughs> my friends and I do talk about it, and the consensus is that we want to have kids before we're 30 because that's better for our bodies, and we'll be younger and have more energy to look after them. And we look at the current generation, and they're struggling to have kids in their 30s, late 30s, early 40s, and, and we don't want that. We we want to make the process as easy as possible. So, yeah, we're, we're all thinking um, late 20s, you know, around 30. Um, and I've read a lot of articles about this, and um, uh, one in particular was... Uh, she, she was an academic at um, Princeton University, and she also... Um, she also had a cabinet position, un un oh, a very high position under Obama. So she's a very successful woman in um, science, academic, and in the corporate world. Anne Marie um, Slaughter. Uh, yes, Anne Marie that's Slaughter. Right, that's right. Mm -hmm. um, Fantastic. Mm -hmm. And uh, from what I concluded from that article is that if a woman has the has power of her time, then she'll be able to manage having a career and a, and a job, uh, a career and a, and a family. Um, and so I'm going to be a technology entrepreneur. So I'll have time over my. I have control over my time and control over my family. Is, is, is the nice, futuristic plan. <laughs> Who knows what it'll be like? Yeah, d don't let it sneak up on you. <laughs> um, Susan, you've got, got it. Yeah, I think I've got several points to make on this one. Um, first, I agree with Fiona, and it's the same in the UK, that often when you have an age limitation on certain schemes, um, covertly, and that is a sex discriminatory issue because, for example, um, the fellowship I got that enabled me to have five years of research and then tenure afterwards, um, which was when I got it, was for people under 35. There was a very famous case of someone who got it but was 36 and was stopped from um, pursuing it, but then she took the government to court and won the case. So we know that there's issues relating to that. Secondly, someone once said for every complex situation, there's always a simple answer and it's always wrong. Um, I think that there are, we're dealing here with very, very primeval and deep issues. Now, one way of fixing it um, would be, and this would be a case for ring fence fellowships. You know, like I said, it's not one size fits all because it wouldn't be disadvantaging a man if one said, let's have two year fellowships for anyone who's had primary childcare. And that of course could be a widower, it could be someone who's had yep. uh, custody in a divorce case, so that's not a sexist yep. thing. But it's saying we acknowledge you've had, as that applicant had had, one or two years when you can't compete on the um, you know, fast track with getting all your peer review papers out just at the time in your late 20s, in your late 20s, when this is going to make or break your career. You're no longer a graduate student, you're not established with tenure and maternity leave and so on. This is the time you have to really put your foot on the pedal, and yet you're out of it because you've taken a year of it. So what I would like to see um, is that you have um, ring fence fellowships where you can then go to a lab and say, look, I've got my own money for two years, can I come and work in your group? And now, that's not the total answer, but it's a start. What's not the total answer? I've had postdocs in my group, one in particular, who at five o'clock turns into a pumpkin because the creche finds her every five minutes that she's late picking up her kid. And you can't do science like that. And she says she feels guilty when she's at home. She feels guilty um, when she's in the lab. Now, that kind of thing, you can't just wave a wand. But then again, when I worked in France for a year, there they have far more creches on site where you can yep. go and visit your child. So there are ways around this. There's not a simple and quick single answer. It's something that will require money. It will require a bit of lateral thinking. 
but it will always be the case, I can see it, as, a, as an issue for a woman, where you want to be in two places at once. Mm. Is it actually possible to have gender equality? What do you reckon? I think it depends on what the science field is, on, on how far you're prepared to compromise. You know, I'm just thinking, say you're on some Antarctic survey or something like that, and you did have a family. For a woman, that might be something that you would stop yourself doing because you didn't want to be away from your young children or something like that. But nowadays, I cannot see why it shouldn't be an option that's open to you. Whether or not you take up the option is another question. But I think one should have and could have equality in all fields. I, I don't see anything that requires physical strength that men have that women don't have somehow. And that's the only difference we have, really, on average. Marita, do you think that you yeah. can see a level playing field? I, I can. It's possible? Um, I mean, it's happened in medicine just over Jonas Stanley's career. Um, it's happened in law very quickly as well. And I think it can happen in engineering and in science. And it's all a matter of you know, when it happens, not, not if. Sounds like the playing field is already pretty level in your area. Yes, absolutely. I, I, I think that uh, you know, it, it's totally achievable if, uh, you know, I mean, you, you went down to the Antarctic for 12 months. I mean, there are women who don't have children, and they do very well going down to the Antarctic for 12 months. Um, one even operated on her own breast cancer, as I recall. Yeah, yeah. That was pretty <laughs> spectacularly. <laughs> um, but um, uh, so I, I just think that, again, uh, there may be differences in the way... I mean, what, what, what's underpinning this, this question, isn't it? More the elephant in the room, that women and men have different brains, and therefore there are some parts of science which women can't do as well. And I just that's very Nietzsche. I just don't think that that's been a, a, at all shown. Mm. And I, I just think that women haven't had the opportunities to shine in all of the different sciences. And, uh, you know, I know some very good female mathematicians. Okay. Um, so I think that we, we should test it out. Well, Let all the flowers bloom and see how many women do well. And I get the comments all the time from a lot of men saying, the best engineers that I've ever known are women. And I think that's because there's so few of us that um, women feel like they have to work harder and they do work harder so they get better. But I think once we reach 50-50 within engineering, you'll pretty much level out again. Yeah. I mean, I'll ask it back. Why wouldn't it be possible to have gender equality? Yeah, good question. Uh, 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 I'm I can apart see from, no reason. The only use of men is if they're taller and they get things from the shelves up high <laughs> or they do things like that. I, you know, they carry heavy loads. Apart, apart from that, I can't see what advantage. I can think of a whole load of sexist things to say now, which <laughs> I, I'm going to refrain from. Why change the habits? <laughs> <laughs> Um, now, uh, we, we want to show you uh, this video um, and get your opinions on it, because this was put together in the European uh, Union, and it was uh, an attempt to encourage young girls to think about careers in science. So we'll play the video, technology willing, and, uh, and, and then we'll uh, get your feedback. Well, I don't recognise the laboratory. <laughs> that was actually put forward by the European Commission uh, a, a, as part of a program to encourage girls into science. What do you guys think? Is this, is this going to spearhead a new wave of female scientists? Pre pretty unsafe wear for the laboratory, I would say. But anyway, <laughs> um, nice legs. <laughs> Uh, no, I think, uh, I think uh, I'd love to know whether they evaluated it and tested it before they put it out, because I honestly think it's a joke, but uh, uh, there you are. So I agree with the audience that I think it's, it would have been totally ineffective, uh, but I'd love to know. I mean, usually they do pilot test these things, and there must be some data to show. I'm, I'm a scientist. I want the data to show that, in fact, it might uh, change people's opinion or say, yes, I'll go into science or because I saw this ad. Well, apparently it went out and after two weeks they withdrew it because of the negative reaction. Oh, really? 
So uh, they didn't test it before they put it to but, air. But, it, but what, it, what, it, what it brings to mind is, what <laughs> were they thinking? Mar uh, Marita, have well, you got any idea I don't think why they realistic. would think that would work? So I, I don't think it's very realistic. So I think it paints a very... Um, you know, it, it doesn't paint a realistic picture well, of what the, 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 the chemical sign for hydrogen, so it's really science. <laughs> but safety and, glasses. Um, yeah. Research has shown that what actually is good to encourage young women to get into a profession is for them to be able to imagine what it would be like living a day in the life of a scientist. Um, just normal practical things. Will they be able to get up and have breakfast before going off to work? Um, what they will be doing during the day? Um, will they be able to leave early to go and pick so up So this kids? didn't yeah. describe your average day in a lab? No, I don't know. No. <laughs> um, and, yeah, if they, can if they can see that, they're more likely to go in. Um, but uh, as well as that, what well, we've already discussed, the impact of scientists and engineers on the world is very powerful. Um, because the, right. the main reason that girls say that they want to get into engineering is to make a difference in the world, more so than, than guys do. Um, and so highlighting the impact that engineers and scientists have on society, medicine, engineering, community and biology is, is what will do the trick. Susan, <laughs> you loved it really, didn't you? Oh, I like the clothes, that was really good. <laughs> <laughs> if I was a science salary, you could afford clothes like that, it'd be great. But uh, no, seriously, I think there's two things I want to, to say. One is... Um, L'Oreal in Paris do, as you may be aware, um, a, a very big women in science initiative on all five continents where um, they have prizes for rising stars like Marita and they have uh, prizes for more senior established women. And when you go to UNESCO in Paris to celebrate this and for the award ceremony, it is fabulous. And yes, obviously the girls have had makeup help with L'Oreal, but that's nice. And the whole atmosphere, perhaps this is, was a gross caricature of the atmosphere that I've seen for promoting women in science and celebrating women in science at that UNESCO ceremony. Um, the second point I want to make is that when I was director of the RI in London, we ran for schoolgirls a series of lectures by prominent women scientists, and we had, of course, the inevitable questionnaire back on the feedback. And I won't say who, but there was one, let's call her Professor X, who invited the comment from one or two girls, if that's what female scientists look like, count me out, right? Now, that put me in a real dilemma because I thought, well, do I just put on um, lecturers who all look like the people in this, you know, in this show, which means it'd be a very short lecture series, yeah? <laughs> uh, or, or do I just ignore that? And obviously, that would be wrong because clearly this is an issue for, for young girls. And I probed further and I asked some colleagues of mine about Professor X. And I said, well, yes, of course, you know, she doesn't wear, she doesn't look glamorous particularly, but, you know, what do you think? And they said, well, actually, it's not so much that. She's just a bit boring, actually. Yeah. And I think the issue for getting women into science is that really the default is they may look at the shoes or the lipstick or whatever, but if you're charismatic, if you're exciting, if you're inspirational, those other things are irrelevant. Yeah? And if you really want to get women into science, you know, forget about just these rather silly stereotypes. If you can present women, whether they're wearing lipstick or not, killer heels or not, and they can choose to if they wish, if they don't choose, if they don't have to, whatever they want. The whole point is to get people excited. And I think one's missing, as the L'Oreal UNESCO ceremony does, but I think that's missing the whole point if you think you can literally go on cosmetic alone. Yeah. I found that video offensive for the portrayal or the misportrayal of men in science. <laughs> Uh, did you see that guy in the lab? I mean, has anyone seen someone so good looking in a lab? No. It just doesn't happen. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, look, I, I, I just want to wind up. I just want to wind up the discussion part of this uh, before we go to audience questions with a bit of self criticism, and that is that an event like this, where we've got three highly successful women in science, are we doing the right thing by putting you guys forward for discussing this subject? Because really what we want to do is encourage women into every level of science. Um, and just sort of wheeling out three fabulous people like you, doesn't that sort of create a, um, uh, an effect of uh, a, a pinnacle that can't be reached? But, you know, a, a lot of women don't want to become top of the game. They just want a nice, stable career in, in science. They might never want to leave the lab bench. So a bit of self-criticism here. Are we doing this the right thing? This reminds me of a, a mentoring session that I was having with one of the very wonderful uh, paediatric researchers, that uh, woman that I um, had been mentoring for some time, and she actually said to me, you're a hopeless mentor for me. And I thought, oh, my gosh, what else do I have to do, you know? Achieve this, do that. And she said, no, no, no. She said, I don't want to have a life like you have. I want to have a life that 
does all these other things, you know, I want to spend more time at home, I want to, she actually wanted to knit. <laughs> mm -hmm. I can't knit to save my life. No. <laughs> but it was, it was a very salutary thing for me and I was sort of thinking, you know, how much that I've given up, as it were, of my other things in my life to be the success that I am and, and that other women might not want to do that. And rightly so. It gets back to this issue about, um, you know, trying to get a trajectory that's more reasonable and rational for all women scientists. And I think that really, that really made me think that absolutely, we want to actually make sure that women have an opportunity to perform in science how they want to. And that's really what I'm now trying to do with the women that I mentor and the, and the men too. Susan, you've got a... Yeah, well, everything has a price. And as someone once said, take what you want and then pay for it. You know, and there's always a quid pro quo for everything, everything you do. And women have always had more complex and complicated lives than men, more decisions to make, more balances and juggling to do. And that's not going to change any day soon, I don't think. So um, the, the, what concerns me more, though, is that the average you know, university academic, the average lecturer, um, male, does not have the same problems and issues and struggle and challenges as the average university lecturer female. Of course, we can point to wonderful women like Rosalind Franklin or Marie Curie or Rita levi Montalcini, who won the Nobel Prize in, against fascism and so on. All those things, of course, you can point to Margaret Thatcher. We like the Margaret Thatchers, you're going to say, of, <laughs> of science world. You know, but the, we may have decided to pay a price yes. for it, but that's not the issue. It's more, how can we enable Again, a loving player. For me, the issue is always that I wouldn't want to be in a position a man wasn't in. You know? And so the challenges, the questions, the price paying, the balance of ambition and family, all that, which is not going to go away, it should be the same for a man as it is for a woman. That's, that's what I think. And Margaret Thatcher's degree was in chemistry. It was indeed. It? Yeah. And Angela Merkel's, I think. Yeah. Was. And she went to Oxford. Yeah, exactly. See what you could be. Yeah. Ladies, I, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> it's uh, what time for. for? Yeah. Oh, what's your, what's your... Sorry, sorry. <laughs> Good female assertion. I'm, I'm just moving things along. I think it's really important to have positive reinforcement, particularly in the media. Um, if if people are surrounded by women scientists doing their jobs, not in not, not that way, a bit different way, doing their actual jobs, um, that sends a really powerful message. You don't need to constantly advocate women in science because it's there in the imagery.